Well, all right, everyone, welcome to this 2020 virtual stamp show produced by the American Philatelic Society, the American Topical Association, and the American First Day Cover Society. Our presenters for this featured speaker session will be Dr. Warishal Faisan and Dr. Mary Love. And the title for their presentation is The Art of Philatelic Inclusivity, African-American Suffragists and the Vote. This session is presented by the Ebony Society of Philatelic Events and Reflections, also known as ESPER. Please consult the event page for this session for further information about our featured speakers and ESPER. Now, before we begin, we'd like to take care of a few housekeeping issues. We're hosting this session as a webinar, and as such, your audio and your webcams are turned off respectively. However, do feel free to converse with each other and with the panelists using either the chat box for communicating with each other, any technical issues, and use the Q&A box, please, for those questions, which we will have our presenters answer at the end of the hour. Following this presentation, we will open it up to our, uh, our speakers who are live and we'll read to them as many of, as, of your queries as possible. And if we're unable due to time constraints to get that question over to your speaker, well, we'll give you the, uh, our, our information so that you can email us and we'll be sure to get that query into the e-boxes of our speakers. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. This presentation is pre-recorded, so if you have earbuds or headphones that might improve your audio quality just a little bit, your experience. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, we wanted to do these to mitigate any sort of technical issues, so we hope that you'll enjoy. Again, welcome to the VSS, day number four, and the presentation by Dr. Fazan and Mary Love. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Warshaw Eileen Faison, and I'm president of the Ebony Society of Philatelic Events and Reflections. What I will share with you as you peruse my, my slide is my stamp interests include African Americans, women, healthcare and science, as well as childhood interests. I'm honored to be here today along with Mary Love to talk about the importance of inclusivity when it comes to collecting stamps. First, I want to share information in regards to our organization, Esper. It was founded by Esper Hayes of Charlotte, North Carolina in 1998. And she started this organization based on a promise she made to the great Olympian, Jesse Owens. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that promotes the collecting of stamps and philatelic material depicting people of color, and events related to the African diaspora. We encourage and support the interest and participation of Black people in all aspects of philately. We also promote Black history in local schools, libraries, and civic centers through stamp collecting. And lastly, we provide lectures and presentations at national and local philatelic events. We are excited and honored that we have an award-winning website as well as newsletter reflections. We increased our outreach in 2014 to encompass social media. And we currently have been focusing on the engagement of youth during my tenure as president. Outreach is extremely key to us. So in addition to our website, and you see our address there, as well as our newsletter, um, you can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Please, please follow 
follow us. Our hashtag is Esper Stamps. Even with our founding, Esper has been a walking mission. As I mentioned earlier, Esper Hayes started the club based on a promise she made to the great Olympian Jesse Owens. Hayes met the famous track star at a stamp show in the 70s. She stood in line for hours to get his autograph. When she got to the table, he stood up and shook her hand. She and Owens were the only African Americans at the stamp show that day. During their conversation, Owens mentioned that maybe Hayes could do something to help black people take pride in themselves. And guess what? She agreed. After his death in 1980, Hayes turned her promise into a commitment. Today, many members spend time visiting schools to share their knowledge about stamps, as well as black history with children. Others give presentations at stamp shows local libraries and civic centers to spread the hobby of philately and the history of African Americans. There is an expression, out of sight, out of mind. Whether it is an image with a darker skin tone or even perhaps an image in which the race ethnicity isn't discernible. I personally feel that images may embrace my culture. The Enjoy the Great Outdoor Stamps are a perfect example in which some of the images have a darker skin tone and other images as part of that stamp collection you really can't tell what the race or ethnicity of the characters in those images. Those images could represent anyone. Enjoy the Great Outdoor Stamps were issued June 13, 2020. I'm also excited for the issuance of the 19th Amendment Women Vote Stamps that will occur later in the month. These stamps highlight a critical point in history. Even with these stamps, there appears to be a range of skin tone in the images. Now, those that know me personally know I'm very passionate about the Charlie Brown Christmas stamps that were issued in 2015. I'm extremely passionate that there was an omission of a critical character named Frank Franklin. Let's dive a little deeper in regards to Franklin's history. Franklin first appeared as part of the Peanuts game on July 31st, 1968. Charlie Brown lost his ball at the beach. An African-American young boy named Franklin found the ball and returned it to him. Subsequently, they proceeded to build a sandcastle together. Now look at the date of Franklin's birthday closely, July 31st, 1968. Franklin's birth was just months after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Let's dive a little more deeper. Harriet Glickman, a Caucasian teacher in suburban Los Angeles, wondered how she could help change those conditions in our society, which led to the assassination and which contributed to the vast sea of misunderstanding, hate, fear and violence. She wrote Charles Schultz, the, dark, the creator of Peanuts, and suggested that he may be able to play a small part in promoting tolerance and interracial friendship by including a black character in his strip. Although Schultz worried that if he created such a character, black parents might think he was condescending to their families. He carefully created Franklin's character. Now fast forward to 2015, we celebrated the 65th anniversary of the Peanuts comic strip created by Schultz. We also celebrated the 50th anniversary of the award-winning animated television feature, A Charlie Brown Christmas. Thus, in 2015, USPS highlighted the Peanuts game by releasing Charlie Brown stamps for the Christmas holiday 
by celebrating the anniversary of a Charlie Brown Christmas. Now guess who wasn't included on those stamps? Well, Franklin wasn't included. According to the Philately rumor mill, Franklin wasn't included because he hadn't been born when the original television series was aired. Remember, the Christmas special was December 1965 and Franklin was born in July 1968. Seriously, in all fairness, wouldn't Franklin have been invited to the anniversary in 2015? Given his important place in history, he should have been included. Now let's talk briefly about inclusivity as it relates to ceremony programs. How does one think about the pandemic that we're currently involved with? With the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been challenging time for all of us. I do hope you all are staying safe. I trust you are wearing your mask and physically distancing as appropriate. With this pandemic, so many activities came to a halt, including in-person stamp ceremony programs. How does one sit back and not take a stand to highlight the Harlem Renaissance? Look at these beautiful stamps. The artist is Gary Kelly and the art director Greg Breeding designed these stamps. I am extremely proud of the collaboration with APS to celebrate these stamps on the first day of their release. When I reached out to Scott English, APS Executive Director, he didn't hesitate to engage. We had an extremely robust program with representation from the APS, USPS, and ESPER. Without a doubt, having Gary Kelly with us was amazing. I reached out to him personally and asked if he would participate in the program, and he was both shocked as well as excited to participate. When we think about the Harlem Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance most significant contributors included but not limited to W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Josephine Baker, Paul Robeson, James Weldon Johnson, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, Yubi Blake, Cap Calloway, Duke Ellington, Billy Holiday, Fats Waller, Jelly Roll Morton, and countless others. Many of these Renaissance legends are also on USPS stamps. The Harlem Renaissance instilled in African Americans across the country a new spirit of self-determination and pride, a new social consciousness, and a new commitment to political activism. As we think about appropriate behaviors at stamp shows and beyond, I want to end by sharing a few thoughts with all of you. First, let's explore interactions with vendors. Often, at least in my experience, there appears to be an assumption that black flowerless only collect black heritage stamps. I'll walk up to a booth at a stamp show and before I have the chance to share what I'm researching, the vendor states, I'll be right with you. I'll get my box of Black Heritage stamps for you. As you recall earlier in my presentation, I collect various themes, women, healthcare science, childhood interests, as well as Black history. Don't assume what I'm researching. As a woman, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the need for the appreciation of all philatelists, regardless of gender. After all, we are in a hobby in which the majority are white males. I want to be treated as seriously as my male counterparts. Let's also explore interactions with fellow philatelists. In my experience, it is not uncommon for me to hear, you just collect black heritage stamps or the questioning of whether a black icon should be honored on a stamp. In fact, in conversations with philatelists, it is a, and it is an apparent in Lynn's stamp popularity poll, there is a perception that stamps related to the African 
diaspora are unnecessary. This is why you will find as you interact with various ESPER members, they're really keen on sharing the history behind the stamps related to the African diaspora. It's important that we share that information with fellow philatelists so that they can appreciate the history. It really drives us in our interactions with our fellow philatelists. So in closing, I encourage all of us to be thoughtful, be inclusive, be courageous, and have courageous conversations. The future of our hobby depends on it. And lastly, please engage with us online. Please visit our website, espersamps.org, as well as follow us on Twitter. And now, I turn it over to my colleague and fellow Esper member, Mary Love, who's going to highlight her passion in regards to collecting. Take it away, Mary. We are aware of this pause, friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Mary Love's presentation is up next. Hello, I'm Mary Love and a collector for, I'd say, I've been a member of S for at least 20 years, but I started collecting as a child. And my interests have changed as I listen at my colleague share her areas I started out collecting world stamps, but as time progressed, I began to zero in on the history of African Americans on stamps. And then I collect the love stamps, um, any stamps that deal with health issues and those kinds of things. And there's a number of others, but let me go ahead with my presentation for today. First, I must thank the American Philatelic Society, the American Topical Society, and the American First Aid Cover Society for this opportunity. I come to the topic of African American suffragists and the vote. Looking at the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. And you will note on the left hand, hand side of my screen, the theme that was for African American Month in February of 2020 was African Americans and the vote. And then next to that is the theme for Women's History Month, Valiant Women of the Vote. And all of that with a focus on the 19th Amendment. So when we talk about vote, what do we mean? To vote for me, and I'm a person who likes to build acronyms, voice and vision, obligation and opportunity, trust and thinking, equality and education. Now, if I was in my classroom, I would take the time and pick each one of those words apart, but time would not allow that. So when we're thinking about voting, I look at all of those eight characteristics in the voting process. And of course, you've already attention, attention has already been brought to the stamp that will be issued later this month. So let's move on and begin to look at the history. I'm gonna start looking at 1863, 1865, which was 155 years up until 2020. So I can only give you brief snippets into the history. I do not feel that I can tell the history without looking at the total picture, which means that I can't pull out just African Americans, but I have to look at the total story. So I'm beginning with Abraham Lincoln and the passing, the issuing, I should say, of the Emancipation Proclamation on January the 1st, 1863, which led to the 
13th Amendment of the Constitution in 1865, which gave freedom to the slaves. Now, there are stamps that are related to that. The first being the stamp that was issued on the 75th anniversary of the passing of the 13th Amendment uh, back in 1940. And then there are several Lincoln stamps that have been issued. Uh, according to my research, over 70 stamps to Lincoln have been issued, but I only chose to use three. The um, three cent stamp was issued in 1958. The four cent stamp was issued in 1959. And the airmail stamp issued in 1960 that has on the stamp the words of the people, by the people, for the people. So then, let's go on this journey. We've already talked about the 13th Amendment, which was issued in 1865, but then we've got to realize why that amendment was issued to free the slaves. A couple of rep pictures to point to that. But then there are stamps to recognize the passing of the Emancipation Proclamation. The forever stamp that was issued on the 200th anniversary in 2013, and the five cent stamp that was issued on the 100th anniversary in 1963. Then there was the 14th Amendment issued in 1868 that gave rights three years later after the passing of the 13th Amendment, gave due process, privileges, and immunity clause, the citizenship clause, equal protection clause. But in this, in the 14th and the 15th Amendment, the citizen or the voter was defined as the male. So in the 15th Amendment, here it is that also follows us on that in terms of the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States, by any state on account of race, color, or previous conditions of servitude. Then that was issued in 1870. But guess what? Within that amendment, it only really meant men, did not include women, and it did include black men, higher. So Thomas Monday Peterson of Perth, Amboy, New Jersey, has been recorded as being the first black man to vote under the authority of the 15th Amendment. And then now we come to the 19th Amendment in 1920, which gave women the right to vote. But you have to raise the question, did it really mean all women? So let's look at that journey. I'm sure you've heard the name of Susan B. Anthony in this uh, suffragist movement. She was born a Quaker with a commitment, a strong commitment to social equality, a teacher and, a, and an abolitionist. And one of the things about Susan B. Anthony that I thought was interesting that she voted in 1872, but because she was considered to vote illegally, was arrested, charged, tried, found guilty, and fined for $100. And her favorite quote was, failure is impossible. Unfortunately, she was not able to witness the results of her fight as she died in 1906, and the uh, 19th Amendment was not passed until 1920. But there are stamps honoring Susan B. Anthony. We have a three cent stamp that was issued in 1936 that commemorates the 16th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And then the 50 cent stamp that was issued in 1955 as a part of the Liberty Series. And then she also has been honored with the coin on a dollar coin that was issued between 1979 and 1981, and also in 1999. So when we talk about suffrage, it means to advocate to vote in a political election. So the fight for women actually began in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention that was organized by Elizabeth Cannon Staten, Lucreta Mart, and Susan B. Anthony. And the stamp recognizing that event was a three cent stamp. And on that stamp are the silhouettes of Stanton, Carrie, Chapman Cass, and Lucreta Mott, an organization and an abolitionist. 
um, Mott was also a Quaker minister. And that it was issued on the centennial of the Seneca Convention. And I can only give you snippets about these women. Stanton was the first president of the League of um, Women Voters. Um, Alice Paul, the stamp just coming up with 78 cents stamp, was also a Quaker. But she had the opportunity to live in Britain for a few years and was involved in the British suffragist movement and was an uh, organizer of the 1913 parade. But opposed black participation in that parade. So she formed the National Women's Party in 1913 and proposed the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923. She too experienced arrest, being jailed three times in the United States and three times in Britain, was force fed while in jail, labeled as being insane and beaten. And Britain has also issued a stamp honoring Alice Paul in 1981, and that's a stamp which I do not personally have. Um, and then the stamp here, the six cent stamp was issued in 1970 that honors the 50th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. And the Paul stamp was issued in 1995 as a part of the Great American Series. Now, how did the women accomplish uh, the goal of reaching, the, of re getting the right to vote. As I looked at this, there are a number of things that I feel are very important. One is organizing. Two is relationship. Three was the mutual conviction that were related to justice, equality, and um, Using the, um, another thing was using the tactics of petition, marches, and protests. And then I'll back up also to connect with the justice issue. I also see a faith issue that the fight for justice for all people was a part of that, was for the motivation behind that. So let's look at some of the organizations the American Equal Rights Association, the National Women's Association the American Woman Association. And those two groups merged to become the National American Woman Association, Suffrage Association. And then there was the Woman's Christian Temperance Union that was founded in 1873 that endorsed the suffragist movement. And then there was the Colored Women's League that began in 1892. So look at some of the stamps that have been honored, issued to honor these women. Lucy Stone, for instance, a part of the American Women's Association, Suffragist Association, stamp was issued in um, 1968. And then Julia Ward Howe, and that stamp was issued in 1987. Did I get them backwards? And then the, the last stamp issued in 1995 on the 75th anniversary of the 90th of the 19th Amendment. And to say one other word about Julia Ward Howe is that she's the one who authored the Battle Hymn of Republic. Moving right along, talking about organizations for this fight. It's interesting in some of the little facts that I found, like in 1897, and I live in North Carolina, a petition was presented to the North Carolina General Assembly for women's suffrage. But that petition was referred to the Committee on Insane Asylum. Interesting. Then in 1902, we see more organizations. The North Carolina Organized Federation of Women's Clubs. And then in 1914, Equal Suffrage League in North Carolina began in 1914. But in 1917, women were protesting at the White House, were arrested, and became the first United States citizens to become political prisoners. Then there's the National Federation of African American Women, the National League of Colored Women, and they, these organizations merged to become the National Association of Colored Women. So organization was occurring on all fronts. So then, let's think about this. African American women were excluded from the white organizations, and you know the reason why, racism. They 
they joined and worked within the club anyway as much as they could and were allowed to. But they did not stop there. They organized separate clubs and separate sororities. Research tells me that the first African-American suffragist was Sojourner Truth. And Truth was an emancipated slave, a menial labor worker, a member of the Amy Dine Church, but often homeless. And in spite of all of that, attended women's conventions, fighting for the rights of women. And her famous 1851 speech entitled, Ain't I a Woman? was delivered at an Akron, Ohio women's convention. And she had the opportunity to meet with President Lincoln and call for both black men and women to have the right to vote. I have included the bust of Sojourner Truth that appears that is in the rotunda. And that is important to members of Esper because we gathered around that bus for a photo op with our founder, Esper Hayes. So that is important to all Esper members. And then here is a picture of Sojourner with Abraham Lincoln. And her stamp is the ninth stamp in the Black Carriages series issued in 1986. Now let's keep going on this journey and let's go to Anna Julia Cooper whose stamp was issued in 2009 as the 32nd stamp in the Black Heritage series. Cooper was a North Carolinian born on the plantation of George Washington Haywood who some say believe that that is her biological father. There is a number of uh, accomplishments that Cooper made that I won't highlight at this time, but she was involved in organizing the Colored Women's League in the DC area and was co-founder of the Colored Women Christian Association, which is connected to the YMCA, YWCA, excuse me, in 1905. And she published A Voice from the South in 1892, which is a collection of her political views and speeches, and is a, was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Continuing on the journey, let's go to Mary Church Terrell. She too, born to former slaves, married uh, Robert Terrell, who was an attorney and became the district's first African-American municipal judge. She was involved in as being the first president of the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, bringing together over 100 women suffragist club under the theme, Lifting As We Climb. She was a charter member of the NAACP, the first African-American woman appointed to a school board, and she was a friend of Ida B. Wells, who worked with lynching, and I'll talk about Ida B. in a little later challenged the Jim Crow laws, worked to end segregation, and fought for black women to gain the right to vote. So the picture honoring Mary Church Terrell was issued in 2009 as one of the six stamps on the Civil Rights Pioneers souvenir sheet. Now, I'm still on the journey. Let's go to Howard University and the founding of Delta Sigma Theta sorority in 1913. That sorority, there isn't a stamp for the sorority, but there are members of Delta Sigma Theta who are honored on the stamp. This sorority marched in the suffragist parade of 5,000 women in 1913 in Washington, D.C., in the education section led by Mary Church Terrell. There are many Delta Saras who have been involved in the fight for civil rights and especially for the rights of women over the years. And I'll just call their names, Dorothy Height, Shirley Chisholm, Mary Church Terrell, Barbara Jordan, Patricia Robert Harris, Mary McLeod Bethune, Lena Horn, Ida B. Wells, Leontine Price, Aretha Franklin, Margaret Murray, Washington, J.C. Bates, Ella Baker, and Gwen Eiffel. And the ones that are underlined are, as I said, honored on stamps. Let's go to Mary McLeod soon. A 
graduate of Baba Scotia College in North Carolina, is Concord, North Carolina, right up the road from where I am, is um, well, was an educator, an activist for advancing African Americans, especially women. And remember earlier I said one of the ways they got the work done was through relations. She worked with Ida B. Wells and found that um, what is now known as Bethune Cookman College in Daytona Beach, Florida. She was the president of the National Association of Colored Women, a founder of the National Council of Negro Women in 1935, and worked with various presidents, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, and Harry S. Truman. Her stamp was issued in 1985 as the eighth stamp in the Black Heritage series. Ida B. Wells, born a slave in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and moved to Memphis, was a teacher, a journalist, a suffragist, a newspaper editor, and an activist. And I think it's very key in the next statement and that she learned of the lynching of three of her friends. And that became motivation for her to become an anti-lynching activist, a lecturer, and a publisher of the Red Record. And as a result of her activism, a white mob destroyed her Mississippi Memphis free speech printing press in 1892, forcing her to move to New York and then to Chicago. But when she got to Chicago, she was the co-founder of the Alpha Suffragist Club in Chicago in 1913, which was the largest black suffragist club in Illinois. She marched in the 1913 DC Suffragist Parade, but refused to march in the rear with the other black women and waited until her group from the Illinois got equal to her in the crowd and stepped from the crowd and joined them between two white women and completed the parade. She helped to start the National Association for Colored Women, was one of the founding members of the NAACP, and worked with W.B. Du Bois and was a member of the AME Church. The stamp honoring Ida B. Wells was issued in 1990 as the 13th in the Black Heritage series. Now, for those who are first day cover collectors, I've thrown out a couple of first day covers honoring Ida B. Well. And the picture to the right is of a museum for Ida B. Wells in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Dorothy Height, some may not consider Dorothy Height to be a suffragist, but she was very much committed to fighting for racial and gender equality, especially women of color. Dorothy Height was called, is called, was called, a bridge over troubled water. She was a very influential leader in the civil rights movement, worked with the big six, and here again, relationships, was a friend of Mary McLeod Bethune. She was one of the planners in the 1963 March on Washington, but did not get equal recognition as her male counterparts. Worked with President Kennedy um, and helped to form the National Women's Political Caucus and was president of the National Council of Negro Women. Oops. The stamp honoring her was uh, issued in 1917, excuse me, 2017 as the 40th stamp in the Black Heritage series. More first day covers, and I must give Don Neal, who is an ESPER member credit for these covers, as Don uses the statement, everything has relationships, and he likes to give us a bit of history on each cover. Thank you, Don. Then let's go down to Mississippi. Fannie Lou Hamer, a Louisville, Mississippi sharecropper, who became involved in 1962 with the SNCC, which is a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and led voting drives and relief efforts. She co-founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party 
and ran for Congress in 1964. And her famous quote is, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. She established, helped to establish the National Women's Political Caucus in 1971. She was threatened, arrested, beaten, shot at, and sexually abused. And in 1963, after she and other activists were arrested, she was beaten so badly in a Winona, Mississippi jail that she suffered permanent kidney damage. So the stamp honoring Fannie Lou Hamer was a part of the civil rights pioneers' sewage near sheet. And so that sister Hamer, she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. So here are some more first day covers. Continuing the journey, let's go to Shirley Chisholm, another woman who may not be considered a suffragist, but I am including her because of her role and her determination as being the first African-American woman to be elected to Congress, serve in the House of Representatives from 1969 to 1982, and was a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus, an authority in child education and their welfare, ran for a candidate for the Democratic Party nomination for president to dispel the idea that the American people will not vote for a qualified candidate simply because he is not white and she is not male. Her campaign slogan was unbought and unbought. And the stamp honoring Shirley Chisholm was issued in 2014 as the 37th stamp in the Black Heritage series. Now, we've talked about all of these people but and we talked about the passage of amendments and laws. Passage of a law did not mean complete freedom to exercise the privileges that were granted by the law. So registering to vote was an ordeal for African Americans. This process was loaded with requirements such as poll tax, literacy tests, threats, intimidation, lynchings, and Jim Crow laws. So African Americans in the South were determined to fight for the right to vote. And that was really granted in 1870 and in 1920. For example, the state of Alabama had a hundred different literacy tests. Therefore, it was necessary to provide education and prepare people to be able to pass the literacy test to even have the opportunity to vote. And that's why, for me, the song, I Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, comes to play in this picture. Because there were persons like Marie Foster, not on the stamp, but was one who was a part of the Selma to Montgomery March, known as Bloody Sunday. She was beat, but like many others, received the momentum to go forth and never let anything cause her to turn around. Foster is called the mother of the voting rights movement. Now, we're talking about women, but I really can't do it in justice without looking at some men who played a major role in the suffragist movement, one being Frederick Douglass, who wrote in the North Star, in respect to political rights, there can be no reason in the world for the nine to women the elective franchise. He worked with Mary Carey in leading 60 women to vote in DC. They were allowed to reg register to vote, but not allowed to vote. He was a minister and a member of the AME Zion Church, signed a petition for women of suffrages that was sent to Congress in 1878 from the residents of the District of Columbia. And he attended the 1848 Women's Convention in Seneca Falls. And he was asked not to attend the NAWSA Convention in Atlanta in 1865 because they didn't want to offend the white voters. His stance 
a part of the Prominent American series was issued in 1967, and a second stamp issued as a part of the Civil Rights, excuse me, Civil War series in 1995. And a coin, a quarter, a part of the Parks coins was issued for Frederick Douglass for the District of Columbia. Another gentleman, W.E.B. Du Bois, was the editor of the Crisis Magazine, which is a publication of the NAACP, it was founded in 1910. He wrote about the suffragist movement, was invited to speak at women's clubs, and brought attention to the racist actions of white suffragists and wrote about it. And one of his quotes is, we are facing a great question of right in which personal hatred has no place. And then another quote of Du Bois is the power of the ballot. We need in sheer self-defense. Else, else, what shall save us from a second slavery? Work, culture, liberty, all these we need, not singly, but together not successively, but together, each growing and aiding each. The stamp honoring Du Bois, the 15th stamp in the Black Heritage series was issued in 1992, and then in 1998, as a part of the Celebrate the Century series, the 1900s, is another stamp honoring Du Bois. Now, I would ask you to pause with me for eight seconds in memory of John Lewis, an appreciation for the legacies of other men and the contribution in the fight for women to vote. Along with John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, and Joseph Lowry, who was heavily involved in the civil rights movement, but have died in the year 2020. So as I look at John Lewis, we must go to Selma and the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But let us start at Brown Chapel AME Church, which was the starting place, the site of many of the meetings and the gatherings and all for the beginning of what happened in Selma and thereafter. At the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge stands this marker, which says, Bloody Sunday Attack in the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a voting registration campaign in 1965 turned tragic, February 17th, when an Alabama state trooper fatally shot Jimmy Lee Jackson in Marion, Alabama. This prompted a protest march from Selma to Montgomery that triggered a milestone event in the civil rights movement. So on March the 7th, John Lewis and Hosea Williams led a group of 600 African Americans from Brown Chapel AME Church, six blocks and across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And you know the rest of the story. So Selma is considered to be the bridge to the ballot. Here's the picture of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, John Lewis, John Lewis's final trip across the bridge. But then there is a stamp honoring this march of the 1965 Selma march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The stamp was issued in 2005 that is a part of the to form a more perfect union souvenir sheet commemorating that march. So in 1965, we have the passage of the Voting Rights Act on August the 6th, signed by Lyndon Baines Johnson. And the purpose of the Voting Rights Act was to enforce I'm putting emphasis on the word enforce the voting rights that were guaranteed under the 14th, 15th, and 19th 
Amendment. And that that particular act states, no voting qualifications or prerequisites to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision to deny or abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on the account of race or color. Now note, there is a stamp to this, to the Voting Rights Act, that um, is, was issued also in 2005 as one of the 10 stamps on the to form a more perfect union souvenir sheet. So, and this stamp comes from a photograph that was taken of one of the marchers in that march across the Selma Bridge. This marker appears at the base of the Selma Bridge that shows, uh, points to the approval of the Voting Rights Act of 1865. And he goes on to talk about the movie Selma and all of that, that is related to that. But the Selma Bridge, Edmund Pettus Bridge, has a major role in this. I cannot end this presentation without going to the African American Museum, uh, with a, the official title, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. John Lewis was very much involved in seeing that this museum was built as he constantly submitted bills that were many denied to have this to happen. But this museum houses a tremendous collection that chronically the history and heritage of people of African descent. And a part of that history also involves the role of women in the fight for civil rights and the right to vote. And there are a few other stamps that deal with voting that I'll put up just as a matter of helping you to see what's out there. Um, the three cent stamp issued in 1949 showing the ballot box. The registered to vote with two registered to vote stamps, one a five cent stamp issued in 1964, and a six cent stamp issued in 1968, and another ballot box issued in 1977. And the stamp in the center at the bottom it commemorates the voting rights, the 50th anniversary of the 1848 convention, as well as the 19th Amendment a 32 cent stamp of the woman voting, and of course, the stamp that we anticipate in a few days. And that is my presentation, my sources, and I, I hope you will go and vote. Thank you. I, I think we all just need to take a moment and I'm sure that everyone is smiling right now. What a passionate presentation and friends, even if you're not joining us uh, live, you're watching a recording of this, the chat box was on fire uh, as people interacted with one another, all sharing that they had learned something new. What did you learn that was new? Speakers, if you'll come on back, to ask what to answer questions friends go ahead and use the q and a box for questions with for our presenters miss mary love and dr wara shaw faizan if we can get them back there she is thank you and you'll unmute yourself doctor and ms love we'll have you come on back Yes, the chat box is just, I, I would think that this is the most chatty of all the presentations of the 2020 virtual stamp show. So many people you really uh, <clears throat> activated a lot of emotions. Uh, you know, you wanna talk about that at all? I mean, it's curious how much we can learn from 
when we, when we turn our angle and we and we you know the, this aspect of philately that's often you know that that's just now getting some light women african americans there's just such a response to it so heidi um i think one of the the, the key points that you're raising um and i think that's why esper members are just so passionate about sharing the history behind um, the people or events that are highlighted on many of the stamps because this history often is overlooked in our history classes. Um, and so, for example, when you think about the detail, the level of detail that Mary um, shared, you're not going to find that in the average um, history class that um, our students um, attend. And so that cascade of lack of education just continues to get passed on. And so I think, um, you know, that's why when um, fellow philatelists stop and, and hear a presentation um like what you heard from from mary you know it's like one of those aha moments or oops i could have had a v8 type of thing in that wow i i didn't realize this and um you know i'll give a perfect example when the dorothy height um announcement came out um, a few years ago um i heard um repeatedly from my fellow Caucasian philatelists, when I would interact with them, well, why, why is she on it? Who is she? Why, 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 does, why does she need to be on a stamp? Um, and you hear that history of Dorothy Hyde. I mean, Dorothy Hyde was right there with Martin Luther King and John Lewis um, helping to set up those marches, etc. cetera. Um, you may not have heard her name often but she was right there in that group um setting up um the key um aspects for that civil rights movement so of course without a doubt she should have been honored and, and at least um i think for one of the southeast stamp expos i gave a presentation on dorothy height and decided to call it who is dorothy height um so that i could educate um the fellow philatelists on the significance of her. But without a doubt, the presentation that you heard today with Mary Love, um, you're not gonna get that type of detail in an average history course. So we're very, very um, fortunate to have someone like her to, um, to share that information with us. Truly, you, I mean, hashtag stamps teach all over this presentation. Beautiful. We have some questions rolling in for you, uh, Dr. Fazan and uh, Ms. Ms. Love. Describe the excitements of students in viewing history through stamps. Ms. Love, would you like to take that one? Yes, I would. Um, I have worked with the younger students as well as students who are uh, at the seminary and i get the same reaction from both one surprised about the history that they learn as just looking at stamps and beginning to dig and find out the research and then secondly i've had so many say to me well i didn't know that that many african americans were even honored on a stamp so it gives me an opportunity to share, show and share with them um, the number of African-Americans who have been honored. One of the things I need to say about the suffragist presentation that you've just um, seen is that there was much more to the initial presentation, but I was unable to share it. So the history is rich. And the passion that I have is that we are failing to teach. And the history will get lost if we don't teach, especially to the younger generation, because how would they be able to pass it on if they don't know it themselves? So 
we've got a job, we've got work to do. And you know that you have a friend with the APS and uh, we'd love to have you on Stamp Chat just as often as you would like. Are either of you aware of a campaign to honor Pauli Murray with a stamp? I'm not aware um, of that. And also Sandra asked about Frankie Pierce, who was a suffragist in, in, in Tennessee. And I'm not aware of either of those. And um, just like I responded to Sandra, um, do we know if anyone has sent a proposal to the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee on either of those? Um, icons. I'm not aware, but it, it, it's possible that someone may have already sent proposals in. And that's one of those things where people can send in the these right to the citizens committee. Yeah, right. um, yeah, that is the that is the process. If, um, and if you go to the USPS website, um, they actually give you. Um, criteria of what should be included, you know, in regards to your proposal. I mean, these people are, are, are not ordinary people, you know, so, and so they, you know, so, so it needs to be someone who really stands out um, with much significance in, in their contributions. Um, and those proposals are, are sent to the Citizen Stamp Advisory um, Committee and um, they review those proposals and um, I often thought that you don't get a response from them, but I have been told that um, they will send a response to you saying, I'm sorry, we won't consider this person now, but you know, please um, consider um, reaching out to us again in, in three years. Because if they say no, apparently um, it's like a three year interval. Um, and so you can s send another proposal in. So, um, like I said, I wasn't even aware that they would send communications back, but apparently they will send the communication back to you. Excellent. Right. So uh, just keep putting it on your outlet calendar. <laughs> hey, three years, send another one and just keep sending them. Vote early, vote often. We have more questions for you, friends. Who or what subjects, and both of you please can speak to this, would, like, would you like to see on stamps in the future? Well, I'm biased. I think for anyone who listened to my presentation, you know, um, I want to see Franklin. Um, I, I feel like, um, you know, his history was so significant. Um, and being born, you know, um, shortly after Martin Luther King's assassination, I, I think that, um, you know, at least from the U.S. standpoint, um, when they highlighted the Peanuts character, that was truly a missed opportunity. Um, so I'm very biased. Like Mary, I would also love to see um, um, Mr. John Lewis. Um, I also grew up in a time in which I loved the Rat Pack. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would love to see um, Sammy Davis Jr. Um, honored as well. But I'm sure Mary has a, a long list, so I'll, I'll, I'll let her share as well. My list is not that long, but I'll just say more women, African-American women. In the wide range of areas, right? So, music, science, art, education, the whole nine yards. The whole nine yards. This was such a good presentation on the history of the fight for equality and justice, but it's also a reminder of how many activists can't be featured on stamps because they're still living. Ruby Bridges, for example. Mm hmm. Okay, we're getting nods in agreement. That's good. From Foster Miller, he'll we'll always find him on an Esper chat. He's, his question is con connecting Dorothy Height and John Lewis. John Lewis spoke at the Dorothy Height first day ceremony at Howard University in DC. He had to go back to the House of Representatives before we could get his autograph. Yeah. What are the challenges of getting African-American children involved in collecting? I would say that a part of the challenge is helping them to understand, number one, the value of collecting. But before they begin collecting, they need to understand the history and the heritage behind the stamp. Then it becomes important 
for them in collecting. I work with a group of kids in, um, in Salisbury with a group called FACT and during uh, Black History Month last year. And the challenge that I gave to the children was that they could go to a table and I had a table with just stamps laying on them, that they could pick out two stamps, but they should pick out two stamps of someone that they did not know anything about. Then they were given a time frame that they could allow, that they were allowed to do research on those two people that they selected so they could use their cell phones or iPads or whatever, and they were informed before the gathering that they could bring their devices. So we gave them, I guess, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes, I don't remember how long, for the research. And then after doing the research, they had to come back to the group and share what they found. And then the, at the end of it, they were allowed to take those two stamps and make a magnet to take home. So that was the beginning of their collection. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I met with some of those and I asked the question if they still had their magnet, magnet and they told me yes. So you've got to motivate them, but I say, don't just give them the stamps, but help them to understand the value of the history behind the stamp.